Okay, so it is 4.30, so I will call this special council the whole meeting to order. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge that the District of Tofino operates within the territory of the Tolokwiat uh, First Nations. And a notice to attendees that the meeting is being video recorded and will be published on the District of Tofino's YouTube channel. Um, uh, so I would ask for an adoption of the agenda, please. Uh, moved by so uh, moved by Councilor McMaster to adopt the August 30th, 2021 Special Committee of the Whole Agenda and seconded by Councilor Steer and an adoption of the minutes. So I'll, so moved by uh, Councilor Challenger that the minutes of the Committee of the Whole meeting held August 16th, 2021 be adopted and seconded, do I have a seconder? By Councilor Anderson. Um, and uh, is there any public comment on agenda items, Ms. Best? Thank you, Chair Chalmers. Uh, currently, we do not have anything, but I will call once. I'll call twice and thrice, and there have been no comment on agenda items. Okay, great. And then I guess over to reports. Good evening. Uh, I will um, just take a moment to share my screen. Okay, uh, so uh, myself and the management team are here to present the quarter two financial financial report, which goes up to the end of June 30th. So the focus of this update to council is to bring forward uh, all of our project status updates. And then I also provide a brief presentation or report on, um, on the financial officer's report. Sorry. Uh, okay, so... Sorry, I got distracted there. Um, so I'll try to provide a brief update on 2021 property taxation. Um, the notices do go out in quarter two, but collection does not happen until quarter three. So I will be providing a brief update on the numbers for this quarterly report, but in quarter three, I provide a more comprehensive report on property taxation. So I will go a bit beyond the June, the June 30th date for this portion of the presentation. Uh, so tax notices, as I said, were sent out the end of May. Um, taxes were due on July 2nd of this year. Year, and there were no supplementary adjustments up to the end of June of 2021. So to remind council supplementary adjustments are any adjustments to the tax roll that occur after that calculation of taxes. And to date, there haven't been any. Um, they can occur up to the release of the next tax roll. So and typically we do see some um, from time to time. So I will report out further on that in quarter three. This is an opportunity for me to uh, update council on previous year's tax sale if there was one and also an update on delinquent taxes. So there was no tax sale in 2020. We collected all delinquent taxes and it's looking like it will be the same situation for 2021. We have two properties with delinquent taxes, which means that is it is the third year of outstanding taxes. And that includes one foreshore property that was deleted from the tax roll in 2021. So we will be uh, writing off a, a minimal amount of taxes for this year. So delinquent taxes owing are $210 and taxes in arrear are $21,823. So tax collection is looking strong for uh, this time of year with respect to arrears and delinquent taxes. <clears throat> this is up-to-date information provided as of the time of preparing this report, um, because we can only capture that this type of information at a point in time in our in our software. So it goes beyond June thirtieth. I'd like to provide council with an update on uh, what has happened with current taxes receivable as of the tax due date or at the end of the tax due date. Last year, it was an extraordinary year, as you all probably remember, in that we uh, kept the tax due date on July 2nd, but we extended out that penalty date. So what that meant is we saw a slower payment of taxes um, throughout the year, particularly after that July 2nd due date. And then up till October 1st is when we started to see more collection of, of property taxes. So for comparison, I've provided the 2019 current taxes receivable after the tax due date so we can see how that compares to this year. Um, so that amount of 540,000 is what was at standing as after the tax due date in 2019. And this year it was at 776,446. Uh, neither of those two numbers are concerning to me. Uh, we often see uh, an amount outstanding after the tax due date, and then we see 
is to continue to see considerable tax collection on that amount shortly after the due date up to July 31st. So as of July 31st, that tax receivable amount went down to 319,000. Um, so adding in there that our cash flow position is strong. Uh, we did have significant concerns going into COVID last year with a lot of unknowns, unsure where our cash, cash flow position would land, whether we would be able to collect taxes and utilities and, and fees and charges at the rate that we are used to ensure that we meet our tax or our cash flow requirements and revenue requirements. I don't see any concerns in that regard this year. Um, I'd like to provide an update on contingency allocations. Uh, as Council is aware, there's always an amount uh, in um, budgeted for contingency items. Those are items that come, are extraordinary items or come um, unexpected throughout the year, items that we just cannot plan for outside of, of what we do plan for. So that budget was set at just over 200,000, which is a typical amount for contingency in the general fund. And that is to pay for any unexpected items in the in um, all the service areas, with the exception of water and sewer, which I'll go over in a moment. So we've allocated as of the end of June 30th, 36,553 to administration. Um, that includes some um, uh, amounts going towards the brand refresh, as well as some network wiring and hardware that was required when we moved to the, our new IT provider, which uh, we could not wait for. And uh, unfortunately, we saw unexpectedly our tangible capital asset software we use to evaluate our assets on our financial statements it, each year uh, was cancelled um, unexpectedly and no longer um, accessible as of a certain date this year. So we've had to uh, purchase a new, uh, a new software for tangible capital asset calculations and that process and conversion is underway currently. Uh, for community sustainability, uh, we've allocated some to the housing needs assessment. Unfortunately, there was an error in the financial state in the financial plan um, preparation where we neglected to insert the amount that was um, that should have been included for for that project to come from taxation. The other funding sources grant amounts were included, but there was an amount missing for that. So we've tidied that up and allocated contingency for that item. And for public works, we had some items amounting to 32,785 for some unexpected repairs, um, additional um, hand sanitization stations and then uh, we also have had the district portion of some DCC reductions with respect to staff housing um, that was not budgeted for and determined throughout the year. So our contingency balance is sitting as of the end of June at 120,566. That is an okay balance going into quarter three. We do typically see quite a few contingency allocations in quarter three, and I will provide a thorough report on that uh, when we come back to council after our quarter three has ended. For the water fund contingency, we've seen min minimal allocations here, um, some with respect to asset management and reservoir maintenance, and then the sewer fund minimal allocations um, to lift station repairs. So we're looking okay there. And again, that's typical to see higher allocations to contingency later on in the year. I'll provide a brief update on the COVID-19 restart grant expenditures. Uh, we did budget, uh, in 2021, 355,000. Um, last year, we expended 248,000 of these funds. This year, the expenditures include PPE and other safety equipment, the reservists and additional staffing in a couple different service areas, including bylaw and recreation. And then we've had to have had to switch the way we engage with the community and provide or offer a public consultation. And so we've used these funds to uh, purchase online an online engagement platform. Um, so the remaining budget amounts budgeted in 2022 may be used for 2021. We did find that um, as we carried out operations for this first, these first two quarters, we are seeing some contingent contingency allocations that may be more appropriate under the COVID restart grant. So we will put some thought to that and bring council back some more information after quarter three of this year.
Um, there's two brief updates that I wanted to provide with respect to the 2021 budget. There were some unexpected um, early allocations to our contributions to development cost charges for affordable housing. In the 2021 to 2025 financial plan, we projected when we would have to contribute to DCC reserve funds um, uh, in planning for the affordable housing development on DL114. And so we budgeted in 2022, but this is looking like it's occurring in 2021. So we are um, incurring that expenditure or cash flow requirement in 2021 versus 2022 of 132,331. So a contingency allocation for something like this is not possible. It will be considered um, in, in the 2022 budget to repay any cash flow that is required. And we will likely uh, use those funds from general surplus from a cash flow perspective and then repay that next year when we find a revenue source for that. So I will, I will have more information on this. Um, while we did budget for it, it was not in the current year. So we'll, we're going to need to um, have a look at that a little bit closer and I'll report back out to council, likely in the either the quarter three financial report or perhaps earlier or throughout the budget process. Uh, for gas tax, we received an update after adoption of the financial plan that there would be a 2021 top up of 136,045. So we should be receiving that shortly. And the eligible expenditures have expanded to include fire halls and fire station infrastructure. So the balance after the top up in the gas tax reserve is 896,000. Um, there's no confirmed use for the balance of the, or for all of those funds in the um, in the gas tax reserve, but this will be considered throughout the 2022 to 2026 financial planning process. So I will now stop sharing my screen and pass it over to the manager of corporate services. Thank you, Ms. Atiana. I'm just going to share my screen as well. So uh, the Corporate Services Department only has one slide uh, in regards to the projects, and that is our website redesign. Uh, the total budget amount for this was 41,000, uh, um, and in 2021, the budget amount was 35,000. And the funding source, of course, is taxation for this one. And to date, uh, we are in progress. Uh, we had selected Boldfish Creative, which is a BC-based small business uh, as a website redesign company. And they have been working with us for the last few months. So we've executed about $9,528 of that so far. And uh, we will be paying our um, contract for this service in three stints. So the, the first uh, third of the payment has been made. And then once we reach another milestone of completion, we'll pay the second amount and the third amount is due to be uh, executed by uh, December 2021. So we plan on having a brand new municipal website which again um, is very timely for security needs purposes and um, really uh, integrating a lot of the technology that we have at our fingertips due to using uh, online meetings and, um, and allowing better access and transparency to our public. So that's the only slide I have. So I will stop sharing that. And uh, I, did, I didn't know if you all, we wanted to ask questions at the end or during each department or. What, why don't we ask questions during each uh, department so it's fresh? I actually was thinking that. Um, does anybody have any uh, questions for Ms. Atiana first? Okay, and for Ms. Best? All right, we can move on. Okay, I guess it's my turn then. Um, Thanks very much, Mayor and Council. And we're gonna move on to protective services. I'll just be one moment here while I start my screen share. Okay, excellent. So uh, with protective services here, we are gonna start with business licensing. And uh, uh, what we'll see for 2021 at the end of quarter two is there was approximately six, well, there was 665 business licenses issued at that time. Uh, when we look at that, the numbers are slightly lower than in previous years as, 
uh, is the revenue at this time. Um, so the one thing to be aware of here is that the numbers don't accurately reflect uh, the number of businesses that are operating in this town uh, currently. So at the time of the report, there was still uh, about 100 businesses that uh, have yet to renew. Uh, not necessarily all of them are operating at this time, but uh, it's still um, a matter that has to be followed up on. So uh, the numbers are are fairly accurate, but you know, probably probably going to end up being about 50 higher by the time we get finished with them and we make contact with all the businesses. Uh, but that's something that we see sort of every year as we go through with late renewals and uh, and trying to track them down. Uh, with our parking revenue, uh, it's gone up and down a little bit. So if we go back to 2020, uh, we'll see that the numbers were um, quite a bit lower uh, for the overall year than they were, about 50% of what they were the previous year. Uh, and so if we look back on that, uh, we did the alfresco dining and uh, we had most of the one lot, the paved lot, was not accessible to pay parking. We still continued with the gravel lot. Uh, but there was a substantial difference there. So moving into 2021, uh, again, we do have the alfresco dining, which is operating, but it's on a much smaller scale. So we're seeing uh, increased revenue in that lot, not necessarily the full revenue that we had in the previous years. And again, this only goes to June. So the bulk of the, the parking uh, revenue does start to come in the busier months as we, uh, we get beyond June. So we will start to see more as, the, uh, as we get to Q3, uh, but that's where we're at for right now. Uh, for bylaw notices, uh, we try and break this down into number of warning tickets issued and then number of actual fines. Um, the warning tickets is one because now that we're on the Robbins ticketing system, uh, those are numbers that we're able to get from the administrator of the system more towards the end of the year uh, when they have opportunity to sort of dig deeper in it. It's a, it's a report that they're able to pull, but we're not able to pull from our end of things. So previous years, we could simply count up the number of paper warnings that were still in our ticket books, and we had a really accurate idea. Uh, now with the new system, we need some assistance, and unfortunately, at this time, the Robbins parking crew is pretty focused on uh, getting the new pay parking system up and going. So uh, for revenue this year, um, again, for June 30th, we're at about $12,786. So a substantial increase from 2020, which again, uh, had much fewer people in town and uh, accordingly less infractions. Uh, but just to update from that, we're now, so end of June, we were 382 bylaw fines issued. We're now 1,280 bylaw fines that have been issued and the revenues are up closer to 34,000. So July and August have been very busy months. There was 409 uh, notices issued just for the month of August. So it's definitely our busier period. Okay, and if we transition to the fire department, so training and incident indemnities, um, again, this is the money that is paid out to the firefighters for responding to a call or for attending practice. Uh, and so we've tried to break it out uh, to give a bit more of a clear picture. Um, again, in, uh, in 2020, for the training numbers, uh, there was actually more money that went out uh, for training attendance. Uh, because the simple reason that many businesses were closed and firefighters had much greater availability to actually attend the practices. Um, this year uh, it's gone back a bit more to normal. Most businesses are operating. And so the training uh, dollars have uh, dipped compared to last year, uh, but the incidents have gone up. Uh, it's been a, a much busier season this year than last year. And just to give an idea, again, by the end of June, uh, we were dealing with, we had already 14 false alarms, close to 50 first responder calls, a uh, number of motor vehicle incidents, and, uh, and a couple of structure fires and a number of other calls. But we're now upwards of almost 150 calls for the year, and we do anticipate going over 200. So uh, this may be one of our busiest years on record by the time we get to the end of it. Uh, training expenses, uh, again, this goes up and down a little bit over the years. Last year with uh, COVID, uh, there was a lot of training opportunities that were not able to happen uh, with the Justice Institute uh, being uh, 
very limited for what courses they were able to offer. 2021, uh, we're back on par with sort of our, our usual uh, training patterns there. Again, early in the season, not as much happens as people are busy with summer and that. So the, um, the rest of the spending will happen in the fall after uh, the summer busy schedules have passed for people. And hopefully with, um, if the restrictions change with some of the schools and that we'll be able to do some of the out of town uh, training such as live fire and those types of things as well. So the first of our uh, project sheets, so duty officer vehicles still probably fresh in our minds from uh, last week. Uh, this one with fuel and insurance and everything, the total budget was 61,000. Um, uh, at the time that this report was written, it was uh, still in progress and had been delayed as a result of increased prices and lack of availability. Uh, very happy to report that uh, after the last council meeting and the increased uh, finances made available, we have actually secured a vehicle and it'll still be a little bit before we get it. Uh, but thank you very much. That one moved along very quickly uh, with council support. Uh, the safety equipment, again, the total budget on this one was $25,000. Uh, there was a small contribution from the firefighters themselves uh, and some out of the surplus uh, budget. Um, this was for uh, purchase of tools, uh, some additional protective equipment and drying racks. And uh, again, at the time of this report was written, it was still in progress. However, that project is also now closed. And uh, this one here, unfortunately, it's FEMA Volunteer Emergency Response Building. Uh, this was the grant that we had put forward to try and uh, secure a new updated modern building that would be up at the uh, industrial way location. Unfortunately, uh, we did receive a denial on this application. Uh, with a little bit more feedback, we did find that uh, the grant was very oversubscribed um, between 10 fire departments that did receive money, there was $8 million given out to fire departments and the remainder of the money went to other areas. So we weren't successful for this year, but we do have some, uh, some potential plans shelf ready uh, should another opportunity arise in the future. And that's everything that I have from Protective Services. Uh, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here and see if there's any questions before I pa pass it over to the manager of community sustainability. Councillor Steer and then Councillor McMaster. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Chief Baker. I'm just curious, what truck did we get? We got a spectacular Toyota Tundra. Well, my boy's putting an offer on this week as well. So anyways. He managed to find one, good for him. The Tofino truck. Well, yeah, Mayor Law. I mean, Mayor Law's son, maybe, but. <laughs> it's a good deal. Brent, is there any reason uh, ever given for why we didn't get the grant? Uh, no, we got surprisingly minimal feedback on that. Uh, it, initially, it was just a one line of you were unsuccessful. Um, and the only way we found out further information was because there was an article in the newspaper several months afterwards that uh, um, between 10 fire departments, there was $8 million given out. I think a lot of it went to much smaller projects and there was a, a much greater spread. Um, so uh, yeah, so unfortunately not a lot of info to go on, but, uh, but like I say, yeah, we do have some plans now and uh, I think we'll be in a better position to, uh, to look at things a little bit differently next time and, and, and see what happens should another opportunity arise. Hey, thank you. If there's no other questions, we can move on to the next manager. Great, that would be me. I'll just share my screen here. Nope, what do you see in there? See my calendar? Your calendar. <laughs> Let's try, try that again, shall we? Uh, there we go. There we go. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mayor and Council. Today I'll be presenting the slides for community sustainability, uh, planning, recreation, uh, and emergency preparedness. I don't have any slides for the, uh, the building department this year as we had no projects. 
So the first presentation is on the forest and tree strategy and protection bylaw. Uh, we had budgeted $10,000 uh, to do that project uh, all from taxation and the intent was to use our uh, new senior planner uh, to run that project so we'd reduced uh, the original budget significantly. Unfortunately as our senior planner is on parental leave uh, we've had to defer that project to 2022. It is the exact same story with the zoning bylaw rewrite. Uh, we had a, a total budget amount of 27500 uh, split between taxation and our reserve account. Uh, this project has also been deferred to 2022. Our housing needs assessment uh, didn't require our senior planner and so we were able to move forward with this project. Uh, it's been funded from a variety of sources, from taxation, uh, grants from other, uh, contributions from other governments, grants from uh, UBCM and our own housing reserve. Uh, the project is well underway uh, and expected to be completed in November of this year. I believe Council can expect to be involved as stakeholders in the in the coming weeks. And uh, I had a checkup with the consultant team today and it seems everything's going well. We've had over 500 survey responses uh, for the region uh, up to date, uh, which is great. And we still have yet to uh, release our uh, hospitality survey uh, and as well as to uh, push our uh, First Nation surveys a little bit uh, harder. So excited about that. And that's again, expected to come on time and on budget. Moving on to recreation. Uh, we only had one project uh, this year uh, in, the, in the recreation department, and that has been deferred to 2022. Uh, the budget this year was to upgrade uh, our hydro uh, our hydro at the, at the, at the facility. We've we sought back and, and are taking a little bit different tact with this and beginning to work our more closely with public works uh, as they move into facility management uh, for us and also with BC Hydro. Uh, but we expect to complete this uh, in 2022. We also will likely be on pause uh, until the district as a whole uh, has the hydropower upgraded uh, sometime in 2023. The last department that I will be discussing is emergency planning. Uh, we're working on a community recovery framework that's being funded uh, solely from taxation to the tune of $15,000. Uh, the project uh, is going to get underway in the coming month. Uh, we've also opted to work with Public Works uh, and on a joint project uh, that will be able to serve both ourselves and Public Works. Tsunami Siren 4, Mackenzie Beach, uh, we've undertaken the beginning work here. So we've uh, engaged engaging a biologist and working with Public Works to finalize our location. Uh, we expect to be installing uh, the siren in the fall uh, of this year. Uh, and again, this is uh, fully from reserve accounts. And finally, uh, we have the West Coast Probabilistic Earthquake and Tsunami Risk Assessment. Uh, the total budget amount is $470,000, and we received a grant for that full amount. Uh, as the grant has been awarded, we're currently working on an RFP uh, that will go out uh, in the next week or so. Uh, and then with that, once that project is complete, we'll use that to inform uh, future projects and existing plans, including our evacuation plans, and the Tsunami Vertical Evacuation Tower. And that is it for community sustainability. I'm happy to take any questions. Are there any questions? Councillor Anderson? Um, I was just curious about the earthquake probabilistic assessment. Um, it, it, it said it was West Coast, does that mean that uh, you clue at Port Alberni or other other places are um, being assessed within that project. Uh, I I think it will provide information for a number of communities. Um, it's centered in Tofino, um, but the information um, that we're going to get may may be able to be used by um, by, by by the region. So I, we're going to test out uh, different uh, tsunami. Uh, 
pro the probability of different tsunamis. And so that'll be based on certain types of earthquakes occurring in certain types of locations. And so as a lot of those are quite a, a bit offshore, I imagine a lot of the information that we get will be transferable to some of those communities. Uh, obviously, the, the the information for Tofino will be a, somewhat more accurate as we've done a significant amount of work trying to understand the bathymetry and and uh, topography of, of the Tofino area. So, I can't say for sure, but I but I understand that we this will be something that other communities should be able to use as well. Thank you. Are you able to unshare your screen so I can just see if anybody that's not on mine is? I believe that's. Uh, oh, there we go. It's back. Um, I just want to check in with uh, Council if they can case there's any issues with your hand, if you had any questions. I'm going to say that's okay. All right, we can move on to the next person. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. I'm just sharing my screen. Can everyone see the public spaces, cultural and visitor initiatives slide? Yeah. Great. So the first project I'm going to uh, review is the Cemetery Improvements Project. This project is well underway now in Q3, um, but was not underway as of the end of Q2. Uh, much of the work being completed is done be being done in-house by our own forces. Um, so we may see some cost savings there. And much of the work is already complete. Uh, however, the reseeding that needs to happen will have to wait till the, the cooler fall conditions. 2021 seasonal shuttle service. This place, uh, the service takes place uh, almost entirely in Q3. So there are minimal expenses to show in Q2. This year, we've been fortunate enough to uh, trial an electric bus. Um, and this was a, a significant effort to get off the ground. And I, I really have to thank Public Works, um, both Fraser Work and Brady, Brody Couch uh, for their help in getting the charging infrastructure in place. Um, that was no small effort, uh, but because of that, we are able to realize the electric bus this year. It's been going well overall. Uh, ridership is lower than in previous years, and that is thought to be linked to COVID-19 health measures and, and just generally the public's decreased level of comfort with being in an enclosed space with, with others, which is not unexpected. Cox Bay washrooms. Um, so to Refresh Council, this is the for the design and construction of washrooms and change rooms at the Maltby Road or the uh, South Cox Bay access and expenses incurred to date are related to design. The design is now complete and construction, uh, the project will be tendered this uh, September and will be constructed through the fall winter season. And I do have an image of what the structure will look like. Um, and so it is um, individual stalls, which uh, can be non-gender specific, locked off if needed uh, seasonally um, as demand warrants. So a bit of a new linear design and it also uh, sort of fits well within the space that we uh, anticipate that it will go in. Skate park repairs and resurfacing. This is for both the resurfacing and repairs needed, repairs badly needed to skate park, but also for a number of small features that will enhance the park overall uh, and just update it. Uh, and the work has been now awarded to New Line Skate Parks, which was the builder of the park and a subcommittee of the Rec Commission will help guide that process. And the first meeting is scheduled for later this week. Uh, construction is anticipated to take place in late October, November. It is work that is better done during the rainy season for dust control uh, because a lot of it is resurfacing. So a lot of grinding of, of concrete and that sort of thing, uh, but we will, will take place this year, which is great. And here's just a uh, council may have seen this before during the budget presentation, uh, an idea of the type of enhancements that are, are planned to be constructed. Multi-use path resurfacing. And so initially this year, we had planned to uh, widen and resurface the sharp road to approximately Hotel Z segment. And uh, this is a, a continuation of our, our phased and fairly aggressive uh, upgrades to the multi-use path. This year, we will be constructing to the new provincial standard for multi-use paths of four meters. So for the past few years, we've been constru constructing to what was the standard of three meters. And it's just, we're finding that that is, uh, or the whole province is finding that that's just not adequate for um, electric bikes and, and the type of use that we're now seeing on multi-use paths. 
And pricing for this work was very favorable when we saw quotes. And so we have been able to expand this year's work to include what I would refer to as the Jensen's Bay Hill. And if you bike the path, you will be familiar with it. It's, it's badly damaged by, by alder roots on both sides. And construction is scheduled to begin on Monday, September 7th. So uh, it's anticipated to take about three weeks to construct. Tennis, basketball court upgrades. Uh, so no expenses to show in Q2. Uh, staff is currently receiving proposals uh, for design for this project. Um, and this is for pedestrian access improvements from Neal Street to the Village Green, as well as uh, fence replacement, uh, basketball, post replacement, tennis court improvements. And uh, it's planned for 2022 construction, but designed this fall. Trail toilets, this is for two uh, urine diversion toilets. I hope that soon I will stop saying that, um, but these are for a sort of innovative remote toilets that uh, use a, a unique way of dealing and separating with these solids from the liquids. And we are installing two, one is on the Tonquin Trail, the structure is in place, um, as well as the structure is in place at um, Big Tree Trail. And that's been a, a really great new collaboration with Tolopiet on this type of project. And so uh, we're just waiting for some finishing touches on the drainage field, uh, which are anticipated this week and next, and then those should be open for business, so to speak. Campbell Street phase three. Uh, so as council is aware that the district received a $100,000 rural dividend program grant for this. Uh, and that work is, is just about complete and is in final review stages with the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure as one of the two blocks that is to be redeveloped is within the highway right of way. And staff has recently in the, the last, I would say month, to six weeks, applied for a number of grants to support this project, and we'll be bringing those funding sources forward for discussion at the first budget meeting. The cycling racks, it should, should probably say covered cycling racks. So the cycling racks themselves have been purchased and uh, we are working with contractor on their availability for later this fall um, to see the structures, the overhead structures installed and multi-use path redevelopment and sustainable transportation node, Olson Road to Gibson Street. So this project was not originally included in the financial plan. Uh, the Ministry of Tourism, Arts and Culture made some funding available fairly late in the budget process uh, through uh, a grant intake called the Tourism Dependent Communities Fund. And this corridor from Olson Road to Gibson Street in 2020 was notably chaotic uh, with a number of identified risks and the district put forward a funding application for upgrades and was approved in the amount of $800,000, which is no small amount. And uh, the planned improvements will include a completely redeveloped and repaved multi-use path at that section. If you if you walk or cycle that path, you'll know it's, it's badly um, degraded in, in that area. And there are a number of hazards, multiple driveways, um, narrow sections, et cetera. We'll also include a transit stop, a small amount of public green space and in improved um, traffic and parking configuration. So the design is, is fairly well underway. Um, we'll be working on that through the fall. And then the idea is to construct in 2022. And that is my last slide. I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. I'll um, stop sharing my screen so that I can see you. Thank you. I believe we did have a question from Councillor Thick here. Yeah, hi, thanks. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Councillor Thick. Yeah, thank you for that um, report. And I just wondered, uh, I had two questions. One was on the, lo the location of the multi washrooms and shower. And the second one was, uh, could we as council receive a, a fuller report at, um, at the end of the season re in regards to the bus and the ridership and the cost and just a more fuller report on, on uh, the stats. Thank you. Yes, through the chair, uh, the location of the first question, the location of the Maltby Road washroom is, uh, I'm sure you're familiar, we're all familiar with that area. If you are driving down Maltby Road, it is in the old parking lot on the south side, if you will, closest to the public access. Um, and it is against the, if you're if you're walking or, or driving down Braden Road, it would be on your right hand side. So the, the beach side, if you will. 
And uh, we tried to make use of that area and some additional land that was, uh, it's only a few meters, but acquired through subdivision a few years ago uh, that will allow us to push a little bit further back and still maintain as much parking as possible. Um, so we will lose a few of those uh, parallel spaces, if you will, that uh, are along that right-hand side of the parking lot, but um, hopefully as, as little as possible. And then to your second question, um, yes, usually staff has reported out in October on the performance of the seasonal shuttle, um, cost per rider, that type of thing. So I will certainly plan to do that again this year. Thank you. And do we have any questions from, oh, sorry, did you have a follow-up, Councillor Thick? No, thank you, that's great. Do we have any other questions? If not, I feel like Mr. Work is next. I'll stop sharing my screen or maybe, do I have that? Do I need to do that? No, you weren't sure and you're good. Okay, thanks. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. I'm Fraser Work, Director of Infrastructure and Public Works. And I'll start sharing my screen and take Council through a set of slides that uh, cover the same types of, of information for my department. Uh, there's quite a few slides, so I'll, I'll go through uh, these quite quickly. Obviously, as, as per the other presentations that preceded mine, these are taken from a perspective of uh, Q2 finish uh, and, they're, and I'll share more recent updates uh, as appropriate as I go through. Um, so council should be able to see that title slide there. I'll look for a couple of nods from Councillor Anderson and Councillor Schalmers that I can see. Okay, great. Uh, pay parking, um, obviously not, uh, not uh, very mature at that at that stage of but we were in, in well in progress uh, with uh, with respect to RFP selections and working with the, the successful proponent, which had been in front of council a number of times even since the end of Q2. Uh, and we were moving forward towards implementation, which was originally planned for, for July and ended up happening in the first week of August. Um, and we continue to uh, spend money here. And most notably, I think the observation here is that uh, finance uh, with a lot of support from the finance department, we, we went through and, and reassessed the numbers for both revenues and, and then looked at our associated costs in order to minimize costs. The original projections that we had done as part of the 2021 budget included uh, an earlier start in the parking uh, program implementation, which would have yielded higher revenues. We were, of course, very focused on making sure that we were open and running in the month of August. That was always the goal. Uh, some, some paces were slowed with respect to this program because uh, we weren't successful in hiring the manager for the department uh, on the April 1st estimate that we originally had during the, the earlier part of the 2021 budget setting. But we were still able to get uh, the system in place for the end of the summer, which had two main benefits, which was uh, one, it, it, it had access to those revenues during a very busy part of the peak season parking patterns, as well as it gave us uh, insights and access to really important lessons learned for the parking system that uh, how it operates at those very busy seasons so that we wouldn't have to wait till next year to learn those and we could apply those throughout the year. So, um, so parking is, is up and running now with, with uh, minor tweaks for the most part in order to improve some of the infrastructure and the systems that are in place. Uh, Council will see uh, pay station shelters going in in the next couple of uh, months to make sure that those are uh, protected for the severe weather through the winter time and, and that they're made of timber structures that uh, look and feel like the infrastructure that we have around town. Beach parking lot improvements was uh, always separated out as its own separate project just in case pay parking didn't move forward, but we still had to make uh, you know, wise infrastructure improvements in 2021. Uh, we were not spent up uh, very high at the Q2 boundary, but we were uh, on track for making a, a series of improvements and reconfigurations, updates and upgrades using uh, as much equipment and, and materials as we could possibly use with uh, that we had here in the yard or on hand in the district. Uh, again, with this one, we wanted to reduce costs overall based on the lower projected revenues for the year uh, because we did start late in the year, but as well make sure that we we made improvements where, where required and we'll still keep making those improvements through the remaining part of 2021. Uh, and those improvements were listed in the project sheet as uh, surface improvements, signage, um, physical infrastructure, lighting and safety systems uh, were the main hitters there. The asset management program uh, has been progressed um, and we have completed the asset management framework guide, which we did with support from urban systems. Uh, it, it was, it wasn't, uh, it's, it needs some refinement that will happen on internally with staff to create uh, a couple of the toolkit templates that we'll use for identifying risks uh, 
and, and uh, assessments that will be common to all departments. And we have some work to do to get this uh, in the hands of all the different departments so that they can actually start practicing with a new guide. But we have made good progress here uh, in some respects, but have to actually get this to work. Um, so, so we'll continue working on that through the fall program to make sure that we can actually have departments applying this stuff uh, on the ground. Climate action planning. Um, we at Q2, we were just in the beginning part of discussions with different consultants as further offerings for for um, uh, climate adaptation, risk prioritization, and 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 uh, risk assessment program, which will identify the most important risks across all, across all different hazard categories for climate adaptation, which would be things like uh, <laughs> drought and water scarcity, which of course we're all familiar with this time wildfire risks, flood risks, which is probably the most mature risk that's been assessed and analyzed here in the district of Tofino, uh, biodiversity and ecosystem decline and other, other areas to make sure that we have a comprehensive and complete understanding of the relative risks and relative priorities so that we can develop action plans from there. Uh, and that uh, will look like we'll be uh, on contract here in the next days, uh, able to progress this work uh, with some great support from planning and emergency services. Uh, as um, Mr. Rogers had mentioned earlier, uh, electric infrastructure is somewhat uh, impacted by the, the awaited uh, BC Power uh, upgrade, which will occur through 2022 and hopefully be in place uh, near that sort of Christmas boundary of 2022 and early 2023. Um, we have been advised by Hydro that uh, the installation of these chargers would be subject to that upgrade. Uh, we are in a position where we could purchase material and potentially do parts of the install. We wouldn't be able to activate until after that was complete. And we would only really be, uh, that would only re be a recommended way forward if we felt that that was going to be advantageous for uh, different reasons for uh, cost savings uh, and potential resource savings. So we're still planning on, on this one and looking to what we need to do in the years uh, between now and, and when that upgrade has happened and made sure that we have that infrastructure available to the increasing use of EVs in our community, both visitors and residents. The zero waste bins, uh, we started with some improvements to uh, additional dog bins and, uh, and dog um, receptacles for the, for the dog bag dispensers. Uh, we are putting in some final uh, touches in that area now, and, and we would be looking at a couple of additional public realm bins uh, in, case, in, in locations that need them the most, and we'll be continuing th this installation through the fall program, uh, and we'll refine that as we see usage patterns change or uh, uh, locations that, that have new points of use or demand, then we'll, we'll be reacting accordingly. There's some more, this is related to some larger zero waste uh, planning for next year. MUP safety delineators, the, uh, the initial uh, purchase uh, sort of in early Q3, or is the for new concrete dividers that are kind of a robust concrete curb type that you see in front of the TRM, kind of between uh, the TRM offices towards Olson Road. Uh, we have those in place right now, which provide a certain level of enhanced physical safety. Uh, we did make a purchase of about $25,000 uh, of this 2021 budget in order to uh, get ahead of some of the lead time and put some of those sections to work. Uh, the next section that's planned for the coming days here would be the TRM frontage in front of their office, which we have agreement with uh, the sort of uplands, the upland property owners. And then the, the priority section between TRM and Olson Road on that corner to make sure that there's a higher enhanced level of protection uh, on, on the uh, left-hand turn of vehicles going back northwards towards town. Um, working closely with MOTI on these different installations, making sure that they're um, happy and, and okaying and signing off on these changes. Uh, so there has been quite a bit of discussion and, and we're still waiting for some responses for the Olson Road application uh, so that we have the go ahead to, to do that and provide those protections for the more vulnerable road users. Um, we currently have uh, enough to extend beyond those two sections. And, uh, and we really wanted to get some familiarity with the install and stuff before spending the whole uh, portion of funds allocated to these particular uh, curbs or these concrete dividers. And, uh, and, as, and uh, we'll be moving forward with the, the other applications in the highest priority areas, more probably closer to town uh, between uh, Long Beach Surf Shop and, and the downtown uh, four-way stop at 4th Street. Road design projects uh, we have here, which was a, a certain, um, number of projects for uh, Gibson Street, uh, Sharp Road, Arnett, uh, and, and Third and Neal, uh, many of which are, are um, related to having designs that are mature and in place for when the wastewater treatment plant was up and running so that we knew what we were supposed to be building uh, at the, towards the tail end of that project and to make sure that we had the, the, the designs matured 
so that we could plan and, and finance those appropriately. Um, Gibson's uh, design work is underway with McElhaney Consultants and then Arnett Cedar Third and Neil and, and uh, Sharp Road will be uh, released as a single RFP in the coming weeks for, uh, for a uh, transportation consultant firm to take on as a single package project. The, the Lynn Road and Chessman Beach Road will go out as its own uh, RFP for, for those two, which share some unique and really interesting design challenges as well as, well as uh, geographic shared characteristics uh, and, and requirements for performance, like uh, with, whether that's uh, their unique sort of drainage performance that's required on any road design there, as well as the, the service and the level of service that they provide for users, both residents, uh, vacation rentals, tourists and visitors. So this will also go out in the, in the, in the coming days so that it can be bid on by and hopefully get some very, very attractive uh, proposals from, from the industry on this one. And we can move that into the public um, sort of arena for discussion and engagement in the, in the fall program. Mackenzie Beach, uh, the design is complete and finished and this project was put on hold. Um, a little bit of project planning required for this project uh, during the earlier parts of the year, but essentially is, is, is ready and, and waiting. Uh, and we've just been maintaining um, that street with a little bit of a different approach this year, using contracted services and belly graders to get a better profile on the road when it's regraded, which will be happening again in September. The Olson Road storm main, um, it has been submitted for applications through the archaeology branch and we're waiting for response so that we can get under, we can get it tendered and out for construction so that we can complete that uh, before too long in the, towards the Q4 boundary. We obviously want as much of this done as, as possible before the, the very, very heavy rains. Um, and we're, we're subject to a little bit of a delay here from, from the ministry based on their queue and how much, uh, how many projects they have that they're moving forward. Uh, we were successful in getting First Nations letter of support here. So that should streamline uh, any requirement for further engagement. So we're hopeful that we would be in a position to get approval from the ministry very shortly to move forward with those heritage alteration, the site alteration permits. The Fourth Street to Gibson storm, uh, which is the part, portion of the project that's planned for 2021, uh, right now is, is intended to be used with own forces with some portions of the work uh, subcontracted out uh, where heavy equipment and different skill sets are required. This is a, a storm main that would go down the uh, residential side of Fourth Street. Um, um, and then it would have an interceptor that would pull water from the cedar stand at the schoolyard and bring that water back across and tie into the, the newer storm infrastructure that sits below uh, Gibson uh, in the new section of Gibson towards Daphne. This project uh, is, is a, a heavy uh, stormwater infrastructure project um, and we're, we're planning that and we're hoping for a start in September. Culvert and drainage replacement. This project is the replacement of the failed culvert under uh, third Street at the corner of Gibson and Third. Uh, right now, you'll see some sandbags there that were placed for flood mitigation in the winter time uh, and are remaining in place until we have this uh, culvert replaced, uh, which was a failure that happened over the the wet season last year. Fleet replaced. Sorry, that project is also scheduled for this fall. Fleet replacement, uh, as the fire chief noted, and as councils heard before, um, COVID um, industrial complex delays have have really made it much more difficult to get access to affordable uh, vehicles, whether that's uh, new or, or the used marketplace. The used marketplace, uh, I'm not sure what, what the industry is communicating as an average enhanced price for used. Uh, availability is way down and prices on used vehicles are way up. Uh, our business case was built in uh, late 2020 where there was quite a healthy set of used uh, mark, uh, used vehicles on the marketplace, which would which were attractive for us to to save significant amount of money, but still be fit for purpose for operations. Um, as of April of this year, the the the, the real market kind of climate changed in a big way, and we've been had a hard time finding um, suitable vehicles to replace the the scheduled replacements for this year. So I'm continuing to work with finance and getting support from finance to find a way forward here. Um, We'll be putting some renewed focus on the fleet replacements in, in the September, October timeframe so that we can uh, get a couple priority replacements. So one for parks and the other garbage truck, which are the top two, which are, are definitely beyond their economic service life. So we'll be doing our best here to, to find, like I said, uh, some suitable replacements and uh, we'll, we'll be able to provide council with an update in the fall and winter program. Moving on to water before, uh, before sewer. Um, 
DL-117 rechlorination station, which was to give us the capability of rechlorinating water that uh, is housed in the reservoir, similar to what we already have at the stump dump location. Uh, we, we had some more detailed quotes come through earlier this year that were quite a bit uh, more than the original quotes that we got from 2020. So we're still out in the marketplace assessing options and we're hoping to, to find a solution that's going to be within our budget. Um, this, is, this is one of those, those projects that is risk of deferral based on available resources. Um, and, but we'll try to still make sure that we have a, a good plan in place and get access to something that's a bit more affordable than what we were communicated earlier in this calendar year. The DCC technical report is, um, has languished a bit in this program, mainly due to other priority projects and, and, and me not being able to progress uh, some of the master plan stuff that has to precede the, uh, the definition of which projects will move into the DCC um, bylaw. Um, I continue to be the, the, the long pole here on this project and, and working with finances support to get this ready to go so that we can have uh, a more meaningful set of projects for planning purposes and development in the future. Um, but this one is stalled out a little bit now and I'm gonna try to get this back on track here in the fall. Bay Street uh, water treatment upgrade. This is the introduction of UV arrays for the Bay Street location to provide a second level of water treatment at the Bay Street, which is our, of course, older pump station slash treatment plant. Um, unfortunately, on Thursday, we found out from the federal government that we were not successful in the 100% grant application that went through um, uh, for this project. Uh, Finance and I and the CAO have have just received this news late last week and are putting our heads together to define what our options are financially moving forward here. Of course, uh, a very uh, important project as it is our water system and identified as a priority uh, for both uh, a, a redundant set of, of treatment capabilities that would al align us with the legislation. So, so we will be sort of hunkering down in our, in our planning and we'll, we'll have to come back to council in the near term with a set of options and considerations to define how this uh, may move forward. Um, whether that's a standalone report or part of our financial planning processes that are coming in the next several weeks. Uh, so we'll be back in front of council very soon with some more um, details and discussion around this particular one. But that being said, we have, uh, we have moved forward meaningfully with the final project management elements of this project. And we just have a couple of little design and uh, project management um, uh, like permits for for various parts of the design of discharging overflow water and flushing water into creek beds and that kind of thing. So we're we're still finalizing some of the last bits, and uh, we're able to access the previous grant fundings that were for Bay Street upgrades from years gone by in order to do that. So so we are we were intending to be tender ready in September so that when we heard about the grant we would be able to go, uh, and we're still fairly much on track with that. We're just uh, we're just tidying up some admin and tidying up some of those final engineering pieces. But now I'll of course have to be challenged by finding the right financial model going forward. The district water master plan um, is trying to define the next 20 to 30 years of water infrastructure and water management planning for the town. Um, we have started this work uh, earlier in 2021. Coors and Associates uh, first task was to help upgrade the hydrological model for the water system, which was to assess current performance capacity based on every system and service that's connected to it. Uh, they've done that and, and completed the assessment against fire flows. And we are uh, scheduling the next meeting to go over some of the findings from that, as well as some projections against low flow and climate change. Uh, we have been, of course, very uh, intense and, and uh, in, involved in our water management, uh, of course, over the last several weeks uh, and throughout the summer because we've had such a dry summer. So we've been um, we've had consultants out to, of course, assess the low flows uh, as recently as last week before the rains. So we have a true kind of um, uh, readings of what the creeks were producing in the lowest parts of the summer, uh, which is sort of the driest we've seen in, in about a decade. So we, we have good data. Uh, we have support from other consultants uh, like Waterworth who, who know our system and continue to provide advice and consultant support to this project. Um, and we'll be able to be back in front of council soon. And I know there's an, uh, an established uh, need or, or desire for council to be engaged a little bit more on the water file to find out exactly what is the water study gonna answer as far as questions and uh, how will it step through the process and, and how we report back to council along the way to make sure that people have information in their hands and have a chance to engage on the development of content and not just the content itself. Um, and, I'll, and I imagine there might be some questions on that, but essentially we, we are making some progress here and, uh, and, and really 
uh, a lot of the work that's still to come is, is about modeling and then moving on to some of the more um, uh, conventional assessments of capital and renewal programs that are going to be required for us based on the age and the risk of uh, the risk assessments associated with the overall water system. The, the next several projects talk a little bit about discrete water projects. Um, we're putting out RFPs for a couple of water projects, which, uh, which are the replacements of asbestos cement, uh, mainly um, water mains that are in the ground and to make sure that we have, uh, we have those designs ready to go and costings ready to go so that we can inject them at the right time in the budget. This is Neil Forth Arnett and First Street, uh, and we're, we'll continue with an RFP for those designs as a package. We, uh, we also have some money this year to, to improve some of our cameras and some of our sensors that are over on Mirrors Island so that we have a little bit more intelligence from this side about what our water system is doing on any given day, um, and, and which is proves to be a challenge with, which of course with our remote system, which is separated by a water body, which means uh, it's resource intensive for us to get over there and make real assessments. Um, and we could benefit from a bit more instrumentation to have real time data at our fingertips here on this side. The infrastructure and sewer um, set of replacements, again, um, a little bit heavy on the Q3, Q4 loading on these projects. Uh, we do have some quotes and options from generator replacements and we're just refining some of our all-in costs uh, before we're able to, to replace some of the most uh, needy uh, power backups for our lift stations to make sure that the sewage keeps pumping even when we lose hydro. The uh, twinning of the force main and the next three projects here are all related to an increase in the capacity for our sewer mains to house or accommodate uh, the development to the south of us at SOE Santai Stanis. So, so there's a little bit of a woolly horizon that when those uh, housing development projects were act will actually be implemented. And we have been in some discussions with uh, First Nations planners and representation to find out a little bit more about what that timeline looks like. Uh, we had committed this year to make sure that we both assessed the need for the system and and what those um, the the capacity upgrades look like as far as designs, and and that would also affect the designs of the pump stations themselves uh, or the lift stations which are adjacent to uh, the cellularly parts of the system. So so we're we're still looking at releasing an RFP that would include the lift station 713 as well as this twinning of the force main for one design that would allow us to accommodate the future development south of town. Um, we, we may have a bit of flexibility on time and, uh, and we have to do a, uh, just a renewed analysis to make sure that we have a, we understand exactly when we would, how many years ahead of we need to be on, on this particular planning exercise. The last, the last slide is the wastewater treatment plant. Um, at Q2, we were, we were probably in front of council um, talking about where we were with the uh, RFP results for selection of the contractor, as well as the memorandum of understanding and the negotiations that move forward to allow us to plan and enter into what is now currently uh, in progress as a redesign phase to get to a, a new design for the wastewater treatment plant that would deliver the required treatment uh, of our effluent, but at a, a much uh, lower cost than was obviously part of the, the tender package or the bid responses that came in 2020. So we are, uh, that was a long way of saying we're, we're doing redesign with the contractor as well as the engineer. It's kind of a novel process and it's bearing fruit. Um, we are planning to be back in front of council in just a few weeks time with an update on where the planning and the redesign of the wastewater treatment plant has landed uh, and, and what that means as far as uh, capability fit within our community, um, meeting requirements overall and across the board, and of course, uh, about cost. So we're, we're in a posture right now where most weeks we have half day workshops twice a, twice a week with the contractor and the engineering teams um, in order to progress these planning. And then they have meetings in the background in between those days to bring in back content and develop uh, their sets of analyses so that we can move forward to where we wanna be recommending a new type of technology. And we wanna have um, much more detailed costing information to allow us uh, to make decisions here at the council level. So, so we anticipate being back in front of council um, within about a month's time with more information and a recommended way forward, recommending a single treatment technology and having cost data associated with that, which would then put us into that detailed design and refined costing that we could then provide to funders uh, so that we could potentially just turn that corner 
and get back on track. That is my last slide. Um, and I'll stop sharing screen and make sure that we have the tile window view so that we can, I can answer any questions that council might have. Thank you. Are there any questions? Councillor Steer. Thank you through the chair. Thank you, Fraser. I'm glad to see you haven't got much going on. So you got some time to spend with us today. Um, I just, uh, uh, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Uh, it just a question around, as you might have anticipated around the district water master plan and some of the, um, you alluded to some of that there may be more comprehensive update at a later time. And I was just wondering what, uh, what sort of time frame we might be looking at that um, either at a Q3 meeting or at another committee of the whole where uh, we could have a much more comprehensive review of that. Uh, through the mayor, the, um, <clears throat> the most recent discussions that I've had with the CAO, and, and you may want to comment here, is that um, I think that the water master plan uh, scope of work and progress deserves its own heat and light in a, in a setting that's appropriate. So I would, uh, based on that, I would imagine that we would be back in front of you at a committee meeting or the right venue to have a, a roll up our sleeves type of discussion on, on the water system, uh, the challenges that we've experienced or are experiencing here in, in 2021, which are acute and, and not necessarily as rare as we would hope. And, uh, and, and what that water master plan is gonna do and in, and in some cases what it won't do, uh, which I think is important to, as a differentiation to make sure that expectations are set and aligned and that we, we prioritize appropriately. I'm not sure if Bob has anything to add there. No, no, not really, but it, we're, um, I think what Fraser is saying, uh, we wanna do something quite comprehensive with council and have an opportunity for dialogue with council. So likely a committee of the whole um, in, in, in the fall, which is, is imminent. Do we have any other questions? No. Um, and it, is Mr. Rook the last presentation or is there anybody else? Okay, in that case, do we have any questions from the public? Thank you, Chair Chalmers. We have no attendees at the meeting at the moment, so no questions. Okay. Perfect. So I'll ask for a um, motion to adjourn. Uh, but moved by Councilman McMaster and seconded by Councilor Challenger. All right, everybody enjoy their evening. Thank you for that Thank for everybody. Bye. Thanks.